Uh, my name is Shripad Nargora. I'm a senior technical staff member and master inventor at, uh, uh, at IBM Research. Uh, I'm currently leading multiple initiatives around supply chain security. I'm going to talk about one particular uh, aspect of the, one particular project today. Uh, I'm a member of multiple uh, security working groups in CNCF and OpenSSF, so if you want to catch me, you can catch me on the Slack or their mailing list. And I'm here joined today by, with Carolyn. Hi, everyone. I'm Caroline Lee. Um, I am on the CISO remediation team at IBM. And I'm also a first-time presenter, so I'm very excited to be here. Thank you. Yeah, so uh, where do you start, right? So that's, that was the question I was thinking about. So as we used to say earlier, right, every, all the road leads to Rome. Today, every security discussion we start, they lead to the sec supply chain security. And th that's for good reason, right, because uh, supply chain security is the foundational security challenge that we are all facing together today, right? And the context of today is important here, and that's why. What is the main problem? The main problem is essentially our reliance on open source system today is unprecedented. And we are, uh, as there are some stats that suggest uh, we have 92% of our application, uh, the content open source uh, software, right? If you look into our stack, start from the Linux, right? All, all, all the way to the code that we write, everything is made up of open source component. And this is just one of the dimension of supply chain security, right? It's not the only one. There are other aspects like secure configurations, best practices. But today we'll focus on this particular one, like uh, the open source consumption and open source reliance uh, on f to tackle the supply chain security. And a lot of time I get asked, right, if we have so much, so much problem with open source, can we just start, stop using it, right? So open source doesn't mean it's bad. Right. I think that open source is the uh, is a core uh, engine that is going to drive our next generation of software. I mean, it is today is is driving our current infrastructure, our current applications. But going forward, it's going to be the growth engine for our innovations. So open source doesn't mean it's bad. But as we heard in the keynote, right, open source also doesn't mean it's free. Right. So we need to invest in the technology. We need to invest in educating people. We need to invest in uh, secure building a secure infrastructure. Uh, so that we can securely consume and use this open source software. That's the uh, important thing here. And we, we are, it's not that we don't know, right? We have uh, our uh, DevSecOps pipeline, our CICD pipeline, where we are incorporating a uh, lot of these checks. So w today, if you think of what we are doing, right? So uh, we start by identifying all the open source dependencies in what we call, I don't know if you've heard of this term, LBOM, uh, where we capture all these dependency and then we perform vulnerability analysis. We check them if they are vulnerable. We do license auditing. We do uh, first testing. And once our, this open source dependency pass through this uh, pipeline, we go and build and start using those dependency. Right. So why is this not sufficient? Right. So why we need something more? So I, I would like to zoom into one particular aspect, the vulnerability management. Right. So if you look into how we are managing our vulnerabilities today, so we typically start using certain version of package, let's say package X version Y. Over time, we discover it has some vulnerabilities. The CV, the, 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 the patch is created in the, and the next version is tagged, a CV is announced, then we rush and we say, okay, we'll upgrade this particular dependency to the newer version. And I start using the newer version. Two years later, again, the same cycle. Right? I call it the vicious cycle of vulnerability management because our vulnerability management is, is kind of reactive in nature, right? We react after the vulnerabilities are announced. Of course, we have our DevSecOps pipeline. We can argue that, yeah, before we start using, we analyze and we verify whether the dependencies are safe, and then we start using. But majority of the cases, these vulnerabilities are discovered on day two, right? We call that once we start using them, we discover it after that, after some time. So if you think about it, right, we run our applications, we often run our applications with potentially exposed vulnerabilities in, when we are running it, or we are using this software. So is there something we can do proactively, right? That was the motivation, like, before I start using any particular open source software, can I get some indications like this is there, there, there's going to be some problem with this particular package? And of course, we don't have Oracle 
or we don't have a magic eight ball that can tell us that two months down the line, they're going to be vulnerable. This particular package is going to be vulnerable. That's not at our disposal, right? So what we can do to basically improve our uh, vulnerability management uh, process. And one particular incident that really motivated me was this uh, incident that happened earlier this year, that the maintainer of the colors uh, and faker uh, library, uh, he was able to push some bad code right, in, in, the, uh, in that particular package and create a new version. And then, yeah, everyone who were using it downstream, uh, the transit dependency, they were using it. And they all got affected, right? All the major 500 companies, they were using this particular library. They all got affected. Their applications got broken. And then I started using uh, thinking, right? So why, yeah, I, I, we can grant that, okay, there's a maintainer had a malicious intent and he was able to push some bad code. But why I ended up automatically updating my dependencies, right? One aspect we, we all discussed that, yes, uh, some developers didn't have the dependency pin. So when uh, the builder applications is automatically got resolved to the next version, that, that's a valid point. But even if I had my dependencies pin, right, I said I'm using this particular version, and now the next version is available. I don't have, I still don't have control way to know why I should update. Is this version safe to update, right? Uh, and what I mean the control way is, I don't have the insights, right? I don't know if the best practices were followed uh, for every change that went into this particular release, right? Or do we have any, uh, do we have any indications? like what kind or what size of changes that went into the release. So we can make an informed decision uh, whether this update path is safe or not. And that is important, right? The, the word safe, that we'll dive more, uh, uh, more detail into this. And this was essentially the one very motivating factor that has started this particular project. So essentially what uh, I was looking into is basically building this control and informed way to to update, to, to basically modernize our, uh, our update framework or our, uh, our release framework, right? Where whenever we get a new versions are available, we know that what this version contain, whether, the best, uh, whether it is safe to update to this particular version. And one core thing is, we don't want to give this more information to the developer, right? Just, this is the more information, no. What we need is basically an actionable insight that they can automate, they can build some policies, right? They can, this, this it, it becomes embedded into their uh, uh, update framework. And that's essentially something that was needed. And that's how I started with this project Gauge, right? To modernize our uh, release framework uh, that, that would allow us to measure some release insights, uh, provide us some recommendations uh, when we are using this open source dependency. And uh, yeah, as I was building this uh, particular uh, project, one very interesting use case came along, right? And it came from our uh, CISO organization. And it was not specifically related to the uh, security, but it was related to the compliance. And uh, yeah, I have Carolyn to talk more about that. All right, great. Okay, next slide. Um, so, um, Many companies are, um, they have to comply with country level um, regulations, um, not just us, but um, uh, many, many, many corporations. Um, so I'm just gonna talk about at, at a high level um, the various regulations that are notable. Um, the first one is the Trade Agreements Act. Um, for government com procurement, um, um, it is important to report on the countries that um, our products are manufactured in, and there's a list of U.S. designated countries that we must adhere to. So that's the first one, and the next is the OFAC regulations, Office of Foreign Assessments Control, um, and these are the um, sanctions. So um, these um, regulations enforce trade restrictions for purposes of national security and also foreign policy goals. Um, so these are things that we have to adhere to and that is the background um, of what we will help inform with GAGE. All right, so how do we use GAGE to solve this problem? 
Um, I'm going to skip ahead one slide um, just for some visual context. I'm a very visual person. Um, so we want to have Gage um, give us information on, we have packages that we're taking in. We have SBOMs um, that we're taking in as well. Um, what are the dependencies in there and where are they coming from? So um, we're trying to answer this question with the information available out there. Um, and so the way we're doing this is this first section here on the left is my GitHub profile. <laughs> Um, so, um, on GitHub profiles, you are free to add your own um, information. I think you can add like your own little bio of who you are, um, what area of interest you have, what company you work for, and um, your location. So, this is what we're looking at, and um, uh, this is um, totally um, up to the user to um, add or to not show at all. Um, and so uh, we want we to inform on the overall package. Um, we're taking this location and we're feeding it into an API. Um, the reason why we're feeding it into an API is because oftentimes the location is just a string of something that could be as specific as just the city name or um, something super broad, could be the country, could be just a region. Um, so we want to normalize that using the API here. Um, and then the API gives us a response of the country information. And that's the information that we're taking and we're collecting up um, and generating a report of that package and um, of multiple packages in, if in, um, into an SBOM, if um, that's how uh, Gage is used in that context. Okay, so one step back. So this is um, overall summary. Um, so that is what we're trying to do. We're trying to determine um, the country of origin of contributors. Um, uh, and uh, uh, this is just one aspect to build the bigger picture. Um, uh, we are, um, the way we start gauge and use it, we, um, ha in, uh, input a list of different countries we're interested in. Um, it searches the countries using the method I described um, and then um, flags um, the con contributors from those countries. Um, and those, um, the results there is just one aspect of a bigger picture. Um, it does not disqualify a package or um, a specific um, user um, at all in our judgment. All right, so how well does it work? Um, the accuracy says 95%. Um, so that is, if we have found a location, um, we are able to resolve it and normalize it 95% of the time. So that's pretty reliable. Um, challenges we faced, um, as I alluded to, oftentimes it's hard to uh, understand like what the location is. It's not as simple as just a string match. Um, does the location have United States written into it? Um, sometimes they're vague on purpose. There's this list. It says planet Earth. Sometimes people put that. I think that one is actually one of the more popular ones. Um, there are ones 127.0.0.1. Um, and my favorite, I say sarcastically, um, is this shrug um, emoji because if there are any developers here, you know how hard it is to deal with edge cases and things like special characters. So this one was just a real fun one to come across after like hours of running it. Um, all right, so um, next I mentioned um, API and rate limits. Um, I want to talk about the rate limits a little bit. Um, so we're using um, an API to go from the vague country or vague location into uh, the country. And so first we looked at the OpenStreetMap API. We wanted to keep things open source. Um, however, we saw that the rate limit of the OpenStreetMap API was uh, one request per second, which was really slow. And um, for us, sometimes we have SBOMs with 10,000 um, dependencies and it's not feasible to have that rate limit that low. So instead, we use the Weather Channel API. 
Um, Weather Channel is actually owned by IBM, fun fact, so it was really helpful to work with that team um, and uh, use their API, which has been super helpful. <clears throat> I already covered that. And so this is what it looks like when you're actually using it. Um, so um, we have this very big um, package that it was rung against with 6,500 contributors roughly. Um, we have this um, example of various countries to compare to. Um, and for each country, it's going to have a summary of the number of contributors that came from that country, uh, came from that country um, and also the percentage of contributions. So it's also really important for us to know if it's a notable amount of um, contributions to that package. Um, if it's like over 50%, I think that's um, an exception that is very um, important um, to the teams that we give this to. Yeah, I think. Yeah, uh, thanks, Carlin. And just to be clear, right, so this is not my or IBM's point of view, or this is not something we advocate, right, to be used as a general practice. Whenever you are using any open source software, this is not the general practice. It's just the special circumstances, as we discussed, like if I'm uh, as a corporate vendor, I'm doing some merger acquisitions or procurement or federal contracting, only during those special circumstances, whether we like it or not, right, it's th these are the federal regulations that we need to abide. And there need to be some automations and some technical uh, uh, vitality that we need here. And the, the only intention to discuss is here to discuss it on the technical details of this. That's all, right? Now, pivoting back to the core use case of Gage, right? How do we modernize our release engineering? How do we use Gage as a toolkit to uh, modernize these releases? So first thing, do we need new things, right? There are open source. Uh, fantastic open source projects already there. Uh, there is a Depender bot, there is Renovate. I really love this project, and, the, and I use them regularly. Uh, so they provide new updates whenever a new versions of your dependency is available. But can we augment this thing? As we said, right, we just don't need to know when the new updates are available. We also need to know whether it is safe to update to that version, and what, what is going into that, what went into that particular version. We have scorecard here. Like again, another project that I advocate to my team, I personally use it. It gives you the point in time evaluation of your repositories. Like it scans all the best practices and gives you the score whether your repository is safe or not. So why do we need new tool? So as I said, there, is, there are some limitations with using the point in time evaluations, point in time scanning. Let's say I, I have, this is, I'm showing just the timeline. I enable some scans, like I need branch production, I need peer review uh, enabled. They were enabled, I ran the scan at T1, everything passed. I, if I'm a malicious maintainer, I can disable this production, I can merge some commit, I can enable them back. And when the next time it runs again, it says yes, your branch production is on, your peer review is on. But if you see, this bad commits has, or bad, bad practices has been implemented, and uh, we cannot detect. And the core problem here is essentially not the, this point in time execution. It's basically the GitHub or any SCM for that matter. They do not maintain this immutable record of uh, the facts, right? Like if you make a change to the code, you get a commit ID, right? We don't have the same thing for the, if, if I change some security knobs, I don't get that uh, immutable record. That's the commit, some, some commit ID or some record that says this uh, security knob has been changed. So that's essentially is, uh, is missing. So this is I call a temporal loss because if you look into the, uh, the timeline, we basically lose some uh, security assessment. And the second is spatial loss, right? If I'm running it against a repository, uh, let's say main or head branch, the scanning, some scanning uh, might not be transitive to the individual package that I use. So I'm a developer, I'm using certain version of uh, this package from this particular repository. And uh, if I run the scan on the head, it says, yeah, there are vulnerabilities discovered. But those vulnerabilities were added much later. Uh, I'm using the older version, so I'm really not affected by that particular scanning results, right? So or the scanning result doesn't really translate to my uh, current use version. Uh, that's, I call a spatial loss here, because uh, uh, the, we are basically looking into the uh, spatial aspect of this dependency management. So that's why I said, okay, we need basically a way to 
bring this new insights, new data to the surface so we can make more uh, sense out of it. So do we have more data available, right? So I look into the landscape of GitHub, right? And it provides so much information. It provides, uh, it has source code. We have the chain metadata in the pull request or issues. It provides security reports, developer insights, configurations, compliance details, release metadata, contributors. It has so much data readily available. And there is so much data we can get from external sources like Stack Overflow and other where we can basically marry this data to bring some more insight. We started with this. I said, okay, let's start with this particular data that we have. So what, we are, uh, what currently I'm doing in Gage essentially is for every release, I identify what are the pull requests or commits that went into that release compared to the previous version. Do they, those PRs commits, do they have labels, right? Do they have linked issues? Do they have, the issues have labels? Right? This, this gives us, allows us to quantify or classify these particular changes. Uh, who are the contributors who are contributing to this? Are these the core maintainer? Are these outside collaborator? What are the roles of these contributors? Uh, uh, who are the reviewers, right? Are these changes being reviewed? Are there in release notes available? Are, are these uh, changes and these releases signed, right? What are the stat and the insights like top contributors, contributor metrics? All this data we are curating. And the important thing is not to just throw this data to the developer, right? Provide them the actionable, uh, something they can act on. So let me just, with that, let me quickly show you the demo. is good. Okay, so let me just start this. So what I'm trying to do, I'm running basically this gauge tool. I'm telling it I'm using uh, one Python package, which is Flask. I'm using version 2.1.1, and this is the Git repository where it is hosted. We have some logic where we can discover the Git repository even without, if you're not provided. And what Git does essentially is goes and find out what is the next version that is available. So in this case, it, is, it tells us there is a new version 2.1.2 that is available which is 28 days old, and uh, you're only lagging by one release lag. Because there are some financial uh, customers that I talked to, they mentioned they have some policy that they cannot lag behind more than three major versions, right, for any of their dependencies. So we can basically build some policies around it. And then important thing, if you look into this, it tells you how many unique contributors contributed to this particular newer version, right? And if you see more closely, it has something called zombie audits, right? So this, these are essentially the zombie commits. So these commits are something, they are merged directly to the main branch, right? There are no pull requests, nothing. Someone has just merged something to the main branch. And all the commits that went to this particular release, they are to the main branch. And this is a, a risk indicator, right? I don't want to use this particular version because yeah, these are not, these changes are not reviewed by anyone. And then the second thing is, if I, if I Look into the annotations, change annotations, the labels that I was talking about. It tells, it, it tells us that the changes that went into were related to the testing, related to the docs, typing. So yeah, I can make an educated guess, yeah, someone is making, changing some documentations or something, so they probably haven't changed it. So if I'm more, more uh, uh, open to take some risk, I can say, yeah, that's fine. Based on these annotations, I can basically allow this particular version to, to be used. Right? So this is essentially uh, the kind of, and again, the idea essentially is to provide this so user can build policies on top of it. They don't need to go and look into this report every time. They can say, I have policy that I don't want to update any version if the changes are not reviewed, or if the changes are not related to any core components, I don't want them to be updated. And then this becomes automated. Uh, so the other example I'll just show you is this TensorFlow, right? One of the most popular uh, uh, use uh, AI library here. And it says, again, the same flow. And here you can see, if you look into, uh, it gives you the same insight. And now it tells you in the change annotations what components are changed in, the, in that TensorFlow. It's a big library, right? It tells you that there is this components eager that change, core change, uh, what size of changes are this from extra small to extra large, or kind of changes went into this. And now, as a consumer or the developer, I can say, yeah, 
I need this, I'm using this particular section of this library and I want them to be updated. Okay. So again, so this is how we basically are currently yeah, using Gauge and I'll talk more about it, about how we can use it and uh, employ it. The other thing is, I don't see Gauge as limited to the packages only, open source packages, right? It should be extended to other uh, open source currencies, I call them currencies like any grand, any composable uh, open source artifact that you're using, like image or any Helm chart, which anything that is version, you should be able to use this on top of that. And uh, yeah, I, I want to basically substantiate these theories with numbers, right? So we actually went ahead and uh, ran this, uh, some, some survey. Uh, I'd like uh, Carolyn to discuss that. Sure. All right. Um, so um, I helped do a, a survey of um, top Docker images um, uh, over the course of a year. So what we were looking for is um, how metrics such as how often are Docker images released, um, what are the dependencies, um, uh, in each release and how um, how much are those changes um, over time and um, are there uh, how often are security um, changes um, that go into each release so that was the sort of mindset that we had going into it um, so I got to work <laughs> um, I used a variety of open source um, tools which were super helpful um, so the first step I had, I used was Crane. So, um, so step one, we have the Docker images we're interested in. Next, we use Crane um, to get a list of all of the release tags um, of um, each image, and we wanted to get a history of how the releases change um, within a year. So that was May 2021 until now. And once we had that list, um, we generated an SBOM for each one, um, and we used SIFT to um, help with that. And then finally, we used Gripe to generate a vulnerability report um, uh, with the input of the SBOM. Um, and then uh, the very last step is to generate a table of all the information that we had gathered um, of the changes per release of each of the things, of the vulnerabilities, of uh, the different dependencies, and of um, how off, uh, of the date of the releases. Um, and so this is the table. Um, you could see overall um, the average number of days and the average number of changes, they're very varied, um, which is kind of tough to say. Um, so the number of days between releases um, can be as low as like 19, can be as, um, can be as uh, a gap as long as 79 days. And the average number of changes um, can be like just a few between release, um, um, but it could be an average of 53 such as Python. And this is just a very small sample. Um, the actual distribution I'm sure is even more varied than that. Um, and the last thing we looked at was the percent change in vulnerabilities between releases. Um, and um, as we looked at um, the releases over time and the amount of vulnerabilities uh, reported, it was a very solid trend. I don't know if I saw any increase in vulnerabilities, which is a very good sign. Um, but overall, um, it only uh, at max amounted to um, a 18% change um, in a reduction of vulnerabilities. Yeah, thanks. And this was uh, really eye-opening, right? Like when uh, we see, like we, we always take pride, like I have an image, I always tag it with the SHA so I don't uh, update it. But then when the next version is available, I just blindly go and get the next version and again tag it with the SHA. And I don't have the insights, right? What is changing? If you see there are like a 53 package change and well, not all these changes are attributed to the vulnerabilities. They are not all 53 packages were changed because there was vulnerability. There were some other reasons these packages were changed and we don't know, right? We just blindly are updating these dependencies and at any level, like at the image level or at the package level. 
And that's essentially something that we need to change, right? We need to have this, uh, uh, modernize this particular approach. So how do you use, put gauge to use, right? So again, first degree use as I'm a simple, I'm a developer, I'm building my code. I just want to use the CLI, right? So we, we have the CLI ready. And this is again, a pretty new project, right? I open source it I think, last month. Uh, and we are still actively working on it. So I have just created how, how progressively we can use it, right? So first degree use, as a developer, I just use a CLI. I give it a package name or I give it a list of packages from SBOC. And I say, this is my config. Uh, and go and evaluate and tell me if these dependencies are fine or not. Or tell me the new dependencies that I can safely, safely upgrade to. Right? The second degree use case is, let's say I'm a security officer. And uh, I, I want to imply some, some policies across my, my organization. I can put some policies, and then whenever a developer is making change, in, uh, and it triggers my CI CD pipeline, in the CI pipeline, I can gen when I generate a bomb, I can basically find out, uh, get the bomb diff, I can get the previous bomb, and I say, okay, these dependencies have changed. Either they are added or updated, and we can run it through gauge whether these changes are safe or not, according to my organization, organization policy. Like the, uh, all the changes were reviewed in this particular new release. Uh, there were no zombie commits that went into this release. And I can automate this and I can basically enforce it across my organization. That's the second degree use. And third degree use I would basically imagine is to be part of the package managers, right? Like we need to get away from these commands, package manager upgrade Y. Because I see a lot of Docker files where the images were tagged and everything. The next command is run yum upgrade y. Right? It doesn't really make sense, right? I'm pinning my image, but then next step, I'm basically upgrading all my dependencies. And I'm doing it blindly, right? We need to get away with this. And what we can do essentially is uh, we can build our package manager, our, uh, our release, our package managers to incorporate some more commands, which says, describe me what updates are available, right? I have this policy that there, is, there, there cannot be zombie commit, there has to be reviewed changes and everything. Validate them, whether these updates are validated against this particular release. And also recommend me, right? Like, tell me I'm using this particular, you know all my dependencies? Recommend me what are the safe dependencies I can upgrade to? What is the safe path for me? Uh, I think that's where uh, I see that we can basically, we need to head, head towards, where we can be basically more intentional, uh, more auditable when we are updating our dependencies. So, yeah, this, this project is open source. Uh, I recently published a blog on Medium, so if, it, it basically covers the same thing that I talked about. So if you want to read more about it, uh, read there. Uh, yeah, finally, I, I think IBM is a big supporter of open source, right? We are heavily involved in a lot of work stream, and uh, we are very serious about security because it matters to us, and we know it matters to community as well, and we need to address them together. Uh, so if you want to know more, we have our uh, code cafe on fourth floor. Stop by, say hi. Uh, there are cool swag to collect. Uh, we have some voodoo donor. I think it was yesterday. Mm -hmm. Okay. <laughs> yeah. So with that, I think, uh, yeah, if, if you want to get involved, again, as I said, we are working with a lot of open source, in the open source community. So uh, ping us on Slack, email, uh, GitHub, whichever way you, you feel comfortable, right? Reach out and, uh, yeah, that's all. Thank you very much. Thanks. Questions? You mentioned a zombie commit. So, even you start the zombie commit, so like, uh, how did you get an like, open event or something like that? Yeah, yeah. Okay, I don't need this, right? Uh, you will talk about zombie commit. Yeah, zombie I can, commit. Uh, yeah. I just want to learn more about the zombie commit, commit and <laughs> how how do you get the inf information from the gauge and then how do you really I guess, uh help with the security concern? 
So, uh, yeah. on my frequency. Okay. Okay, so uh, yeah, so zombie commit essentially, as I mentioned, right? So again, this is not a standard term; it's just something I came uh, came along. Uh, no words, uh, but it basically signifies that I have some commits and I don't have any history or any asso metadata associated with it. Like this commit is not linked, linked to any PR, so these are essentially merged with the master. So what we uh, currently are doing is when, when I get a release, I know the, the commit of that particular release and the previous release. Now. I basically make a query to identify all the commits that particular that went into between that particular range, right? So there is a GraphQL query uh, I make and get that data from GitHub. And now for each commit, I can I basically query it again to see if it is associated with any pull request. Right? If it is not, that means it's a then I classify it as a zombie commit. Right? And uh, yeah, I think th that is essentially one serious thing with any practice right no one should be merging anything with the in the main branch directly without any pull any preview or any pull request any other question <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so for people that are committing from potentially outside in an embargo country, something like that, is just looking at their location on GitHub enough, or is it kind of like the website you say, make sure you're over 13 years old and everybody's clicking, even though they're not years old, you just, you just don't care because they're passing check on compliance? Yeah, so. If that, so we are basically running gauge in two mode, right? When we are assessing this uh, release, we are not logging into the location. Location essentially is a separate evaluation that we do, separate uh, revaluation we do. But uh, to your point, right? So when uh, we, what the data that we have is the only data that that is available with the GitHub. And as Carolyn was mentioning, that data is not reliable, but that's the only thing we can uh, we can work with. Uh, so we don't have the information like uh, the age or other PII associated with the developer, with that. Uh, and uh, I personally think, right, if we we are basically serious about the identity, we need to follow the model like Twitter, right? Like it should be the responsibility of the platform to validate, verify the uh, when they onboard any user. It should be the uh, responsibility of developer to put a like. If you go to Twitter, you have a tick mark that can say, oh, we have verified this particular celebrity, right? So similar things we should be done, it should be done on the platform level because all we can do is the data engineering and the machine learning and everything. But if you want to be basically international, and this is again a sensitive topic about identity, but I think it should be the responsibility of platform, like GitHub about this thing to verify the identity and provide some indications like we have verified this particular developer and whatever, these are the information you can query. Uh, the other thing that I, was, I haven't basically uh, thought about detail, but I was listening to that earlier with the git sign, right? If you have certificate associated with that, if you can access those, is there something we can do with that, right? Is there any information there uh, in the certificate that we can use? Because if you are, I'm using git sign to basically sign these, uh, my commits, can I explore that further? We haven't. Uh, done that yet. Yeah, and definitely agree with all those points. I just wanted to reiterate that um, the ultimate goal is to comply with the regulations, um, and so we are just performing our due diligence. So we are just looking at what's available online. We're not probing further. Um, we're just doing what we can with what's available and moving on. I think we yeah, had the one minute left sign. Yeah, I think uh, that's all. That's all the time we had. So thank you everyone for uh, attending and listening to the talk. Uh, and uh, yeah, if, if you want to learn more, uh, keep in touch. Thank you. Great, thank you.